I am an American board certified OBGYN, a mom, a Muslim, and I'm talking about sex. This is the Muslim Sex Podcast. Welcome to the Muslim Sex Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Sada Flody. This episode is everything you need to know about breastfeeding. But before I get into it, the first thing I want to make very clear is that I'm not giving any type of medical or religious advice. So if you have any concerns about your health, please be sure to see your medical provider. And if you have any questions about your religion, please ask your friendly neighborhood religious leader. It's the Muslim Sex Podcast because I just happen to be a Muslim woman who talks about sex. So today I want to get into talking about breastfeeding. As we all know, breastfeeding is very important, and if a woman is able to breastfeed her child, that's even better for the child. Um, Of course, there's no shame in using formula. I myself have used uh, formula for all three of my children, and and they're doing just fine. So there's no shame or harm in using formula, but of course, as we know, breast definitely is best. Um, And the reason why that is is because the babies get a lot of immunity from the mom, especially in the first six months before they develop their own immunity. In fact, UNICEF and the WHO recommend that children be exclusively breastfed from the first year of life up until the first six months. And then we add supplemental foods as needed and children can be, infants can be breastfed up until two years of age. But of course, you know, as we know, it's whatever is going to work for the mom and her baby. And sometimes going back to work can make it very difficult for the mom to continue breastfeeding. However, you know, if the mom is able to pump, then that's also very good. And you can put that milk into the fridge, you can put it into the freezer, and then the caregiver for the infant can then take out that milk and um, feed the baby. As we know, you know, in the fridge, milk is good for fresh milk is good for about four days and in the freezer for about um, four weeks. So and sometimes even longer. So that's really important. And uh, if you're able to pump and store that milk, that's even better for the baby. Um, So there's four different stages of what we call lactogenesis, and that's the formation of the milk. And the first stage actually happens in the second trimester up until delivery. And that's where the milk ducts will grow in number and size and the breasts start to become a little bit fuller, the nipples will darken, and we get what those are called the Montgomery glands, which are little glands that are um, around the areola and they secrete oil and lubricate the nipple. There's also the production of the baby's first colostrum that happens Stage two of lactogenesis is uh, happens right after two to three days after birth. And um, what happens with that is that uh, the estrogen and the progesterone tend to drop off uh, right after delivery. Uh, after the delivery of the placenta, those hormones drop off. And what happens is that the prolactin, prolactin hormone, which is a hormone that's needed for uh, milk, production in the breast goes up. And so then milk production will dramatically go up and the milk will start to come in. And then what happens is that often, especially after the third or fourth day after delivery, you'll notice that the breasts get significantly more engorged and filled with milk. And they may even become tender and painful or sore. Um, And then stage three lactogenesis is the rest of the time when you lactate and the milk will continue as long as that milk is being removed from the breast. And it's all about supply and demand. So the more that you breastfeed your infant, the more that milk will come in. If you start to decrease that frequency, then there'll be less milk also present in the breast. Um, You know, the ability to breastfeed an infant is oftentimes affected by different hormonal conditions. So for example, if you end up taking a birth control pill that has estrogen, that will definitely decrease your blood, uh, your milk supply. And also if there's any delays in the breastfeeding or if there's separation of mom and baby, or for example, if the baby goes to the NICU and the mom is not well and the mom is not able to 
breastfeed the infant, then that milk supply will go down. Also, for example, if there's been some trauma to the breast or the nipple, sometimes that may make it difficult to nurse your infant. Other conditions such as hepatitis, active hepatitis, or HIV, uh, might you may not be able to breastfeed your infant. So it's always best to check with the pediatrician or the neonatologist or your obstetrician to make sure that um, there isn't a condition that for which you're not able to breastfeed your infant, or if you're having difficulty breastfeeding your infant, it's very important to see a lactation consultant, which are often available at the hospital. And a lot of times your postpartum nurse is certified to help you um, how to breastfeed, to teach you how to breastfeed. Also, what's important is that, um, you know, pumping. So like we spoke about before, the more you pump, the more milk is going to come in. And typically we tell women to try to pump every two to three hours if you can, definitely while awake. And then at night, um, you know, it might be easier to feed on demand when the infant is up and try not to wake up the baby. But definitely during the daylight hours to try to pump and, um, and or breastfeed every two to three hours. Now, what's also important when you start to breastfeed is that um, some women think that you're not able to get pregnant when you breastfeed, and that is not always true. What happens is that your ovulation can be suppressed. However, I know lots of women that you know were breastfeeding, and 13 months later, they have a new baby on the way, or a new baby is born within 13 months of their first baby. So it's important to note that uh, Breastfeeding is not always a fail-safe method for contraception. Now, if you're exclusively breastfeeding, that may make a difference and ovulation may you know, be suppressed. But still, I wouldn't take any chances, especially if you're not looking to get pregnant really soon, I would use a form of contraception. And there are lots of forms of contraception. There are uh, the IUD that you can have placed right after you give birth. It can be the copper IUD. It can even be... Um, a progesterone containing IUD. You can also get to the implant, the uh, Nexplanon, which goes into the upper arm. Um, you can have that placed right postpartum. You can also get the Depo-Provera injection. And so anything containing progesterone is safe um, with breastfeeding. And you can also even take those mini pills and none of those should decrease your milk supply. The progesterone only contraception should be fine with breastfeeding. It's the estrogen that typically reduces the milk supply. And so that's why it's important to be wary of those uh, contraceptive uh, contraceptions that um, contain estrogen. So also another um, type of myth that we often hear is that breastfeeding can uh, ruin the shape of your breasts. And a lot of women will find that the breasts go back to their normal shape. However, it is important to note that if you are nursing from one side to make sure that you do nurse from the other side as well, because sometimes women, if you exclusively feed from one breast, um, can, after you are done breastfeeding, one breast can uh, appear bigger than the other. So that's why it's always important to alternate the sides that you nurse from when you when you are breastfeeding your infant. Also, uh, some important things about um, food in terms of what type of nutrients you should have. So it is definitely important to be taking calcium. Now, calcium that the baby gets in the milk does come from your body. And so from your body stores of calcium, which are primarily your bones, um, that's where your baby's going to get its calcium from in the breast milk. So it's important that you take at least a thousand milligrams of calcium. And if for those teenage moms, they may need to take a little bit more calcium, you know, for example, 1300 milligrams. So that's going to be very important to add that to your diet along with your prenatal vitamins. And the, your prenatal vitamins make sure that they contain at least 400 micrograms of folic acid. Also, along with the calcium, you want to make sure that you're taking vitamin D. Vitamin D is important for the absorption of that calcium. And 
most people suggest that you get at least 400 international units of vitamin D. So make sure that anytime you take calcium that you'll also take vitamin D, which uh, helps with the absorption. Also, what's going to be important is making sure that you are taking in enough protein when you are breastfeeding. Now, typically they say you need about six to six and a half ounces of protein when you're nursing. And these are typically two to three servings of lean meat, poultry, or fish, and usually about three ounces um, in a serving. It's so important that you incorporate that into your diet because I also felt um, I also feel that when a woman takes protein into her diet, that that actually improves the consistency of the milk and it seems to satiate the infants a little bit more. So that's going to be important. So make sure that you do take in um, adequate amounts of protein when you're nursing. Iron, of course, is also very helpful and helps maintain your energy levels when you are nursing because it is um, very, it can be very taxing and you're exhausted as it is when you're nursing a newborn. So it's important to maintain your energy level and iron will help with that. And especially if you've lost a lot of blood when um, you delivered, you know, it's going to be important to replenish those iron stores. So make sure that your vitamin contains iron. You know, sources of iron that might be helpful if you don't want to take a tablet, it would be, you know, definitely lean meats and dark leafy green vegetables, um, such as spinach, broccoli, any of those uh, are important and would help restore your iron stores in your body. And like I mentioned before, of course, you know, folic acid, you want to make sure that you're taking at least 400 micrograms of folic acid to help with um, the nursing and making sure that uh, if for by any chance you end up getting pregnant while you are nursing, that that 400 micrograms of folic acid is going to help prevent any type of birth defects in your fetus. So that's why that's important. So let's talk a little bit about engorgement and what happens. So sometimes what can happen is that when you are um, breastfeeding, and, you know, if you're, if the amount of milk that you're producing is more than the demand from your infant, your breast can definitely get engorged. And when that happens, it can be very painful. Uh, what you may want to do if that engorgement happens is that you can definitely soak a cloth in warm water and put it um, against the breast, or you can take a warm shower and in that shower, try to express some milk so that the engorgement goes down in the breasts. Um, also, you can try to use uh, a breast pump and that will also help with the engorgement. Um, you know, sometimes it's going to be helpful that uh, if you put a cold compress on those breasts, you know, really so to see what helps the most to you and what feels the best. Also, something that women um, and uh, physicians have recommended throughout time and midwives even, have uh, suggested is to use cabbage. So nobody knows why or how that works, but if you use a cabbage leaf, it could be either you know a green or a purple cabbage leaf, and you take it from the fridge and you put it uh, inside of your bra. And if you have an engorged breast, it helps with the engorgement actually. And that cold um, leaf against that uh, breast tissue really helps with the engorgement. So you know, that might be something that you decide to do if you end up with engorged breasts. Um, you can keep that cabbage leaf in there, you know, as long as you need and uh, typically only until that swelling and that pain goes down. And then of course, you know, you can get rid of that cabbage leaf or even before if your engorgement starts to go down and you feel better, you know, definitely you don't need to keep it in inside. Um, you know, another thing that's very important to discuss and something for you to know about is mastitis. And what happens is that sometimes uh, the breast becomes so engorged that um, that um, that breast can that breast tissue and um, can get an infection. And that's what or an inflammation. And that's what we call mastitis. And uh, what happens is that um, you can have breast tenderness, you can have swelling, you can be warm to the breasts can be warm to the touch. 
Um, you can have pain or burning sensation while you're breastfeeding. And sometimes you can just have a feeling of you're just not feeling well, right? You just feel ill and that skin can be red. It can be tender to the touch. It can be warm. And sometimes women will get a fever of greater than 100.4. And if that happens, um, sometimes why that happens is you can get a blocked milk duct. Um, you can sometimes if there's a crack in the skin or something like that, a bacteria can enter and cause that inflammation or infection in that breast tissue. What's going to happen is that if you, some of the risk factors, in fact, if um, in developing mastitis can be, like I mentioned before, it can be sore or cracked nipples. You can have anything that restricts the milk flow. For example, um, uh, if you have, you know, a tight sports bra or something like that, but typically it's if you've had, if you have like some cracked nipples, that's usually when the bacteria enters and, um, you know, can cause an infection and can be very tender and very painful. Um, also, it can be due to improper nursing technique uh, and sometimes some uh, insufficient or poor nutrition. Now, if that happens, if any of those things happen, it's going to be important for you to see your doctor and get in. And uh, a lot of times the doctor, if they decide that you do have mastitis, if you do have an infection, then they'll give you some antibiotics to take and that will resolve that infection. Um, some ways to prevent uh, mastitis from occurring is, you know, try to fully drain or empty out that breast. So when you're nursing your infant, it's going to be important to try to empty out that breast completely before switching over to the other breast and then trying to empty out that breast as well. Um, and change the position if you're when you're breastfeeding, if you notice that the baby is not latching on properly, you know, try to change positions so that uh, the baby does latch properly and so that the milk can be emptied out of your breast. Um, and, uh, and that's, you know, some of the most important things that you can do is definitely checking that latch. And again, if you are having trouble nursing and you decide that you want to continue nursing, you know, make sure that you get a consultation with your, you know, friendly neighborhood lactation consultant. And like I said before, most of the times those will be nurses in the postpartum department that can help you out. Some pediatricians are also certified and some OBs are also certified in um, lactation. So it might be helpful just for you to seek those out. Also, now since the pandemic, a lot of uh, lactation consultants are doing um, consulting over Zoom. And so that might be helpful, especially when you're nursing and it's difficult to get away and you don't have anyone to watch your infant or your baby. You know, it might be helpful to do a Zoom session with a lactation consultant so that they can kind of look at the position that you have the baby in and um, make sure that the baby is latching on correctly and give you other pointers to prevent mastitis and definitely help with the latching of the infant. Now, you know, when it comes time to wean, it's important that uh, you slowly start to wean. And um, what you can do is you can start to increase the hours in between your feeding and slowly do that over a few weeks. And um, that will eventually start to dry up your milk supply. So it is, you know, supply and demand. And uh, wearing a tight sports bra will also help in terms of drying up that milk. In fact, we tell women that um, have had, say, a stillborn, <clears throat> and when their breasts, even after that delivery, you know, their breasts will also engorge and fill up with milk in anticipation of nursing um, the infant. What we tell those mothers is to wear a tight sports bra so that that milk can dry up. So that is the end of this podcast. I hope that it's been beneficial to you. And um and that you've taken away some helpful pointers. And so I am done here and it's been real and really intimate. And remember that this is not meant to be medical advice. So if you're having any issues with breastfeeding, then please seek out your healthcare provider and get their uh, evaluation and their input in terms of what you might be experiencing. 
And until next time, this is the Muslim Sex Podcast. Thank you.